Hey everybody, welcome to Ask an Old GM. All right. uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, all right, uh, I have a program where you can ask me role-playing game, tabletop-based role-playing game questions, and I will do my best to answer them and help you out with your game mastering and stuff. Hey DM Stretch, how you doing? Right. Um, I have 41 years of experience game mastering, right? and uh, I've game mastered most systems. Hey second hand, how you doing? Okay, the other thing I do here is that I review World Anvil articles, right? Um, there's a booty coin thing that you can do to get an editor or critique if you watch the show long enough, basically. Uh, 2,000 booty coins will get you an editor or critique, right? Um, I'm gonna get her to put something in there a little bit, bit less than that for uh, World Anvil articles because 2,000 points is too much. Right? Right. I think 500 should be more like it. World Anvil articles are. Booty coins, yes, Sog. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. Zog, exactly. 2,000 for an edit, maybe 500 for a review. Oh, thanks. I guess I will hydrate. Hail hydrate. Well, um, Sable's supposed to be on here with me pretty quick, too, so we can discuss some Vampire the Masquerade stuff. I, I understand somebody was interested in that, and I, she's our resident expert on that. That's why we got this funky cyberpunk music on too, because it's uh... <laughs> Yeah. Alright, well, I'm bringing on Sable as a guest to discuss it, because some people do like a good old-fashioned world of darkness. And I find the game system clunky at best. And if Esong ever shows up, I will show you my kit. Because she wanted to see the kit. Yeah, I think that's why she's coming on, actually, DM Stretch, is to discuss Vampire the Masquerade for you, because you mentioned it that you were interested in, but you just never had a chance to play it. Oh, yeah. Giovanni Chronicles are very interesting. Cannibal vampires. Yeah.
yeah, don't read ahead if you're putting a play in it. That's for sure. Hi, Lorraine. How are you? That's always difficult. Right. Um, have you ever done a split party before, Lorraine? Okay, so uh, is the party... Did she get captured then and sleeping poison? Welcome, Sable. I don't know if this is going to be needed, but I figured this is where the stream monitor thing is. Mm hmm. You need a chair? A chair might be helpful, eh? Yeah. Okay. I forgot you stole my chair. You're going to have to pass me my coffee chair. On that side. I suppose I could. Okay. Okay. Not from a bed party I'm trying to the city. Ah, so a crash, bang. Probably should have paused this video. That's okay. Whatever. I'm trying to help Lorraine here at the moment. Okay. What's up right. with Lorraine? Uh, Lorraine's got a, a plot problem with her game. Okay. One of her players, characters, failed her save against a sleep poison. Uh-oh. And has been... Uh, kidnapped. Aha. Uh -huh. Is that going to be long enough? Nope. And then we're gonna have to change headphones. One or two. Yeah, okay. Okay, there you go. Right. Put this here. So I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Sorry for the confusion today, guys. It was a little chaotic before we came on. Yeah, it works. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, you can't fireball when you're all tied up. That's how I would do it. Right, and gag. Sure, how are you going to form the somatic components for that? Right, or the verbal ones. And if you're ones. gag, how are you going to do verbal ones? Right, and fireball requires that you have a material component. I don't know if it does in 5th edition, actually. Don't quote me on that, but... Yeah. I'm pretty sure you gotta have bat guano for fireball. Right? Component or focus, right. Either way, they're gonna strip her focus away. Is bat guano still a thing? Since second hand summer? I don't know, is it? It you is guys... in our world. It's important to the plot at one point. It is, very. The plot of the story. 
Yeah, the Toy Soldier Saga, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Key, uh, key plot component, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> It's not a valued material like a diamond worth 300 gold pieces for uh, Revenge of Five. Yeah, fair enough. For sure. But, Hello, uh, Stormbro. Nice, nice to Storm see Bro. you. Hi, Stormbro. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you for the follow. Right I, on. Um, it may not be a valued material, but if she's in her pajamas, having been stripped from her bed, I doubt she's got any on her. Yeah, second right. hand says, yeah, it's what I remember and like the pouch of stuff for magic to happen, exactly. Yeah. Oh, so 5e says components or focus in that case, says Lorraine. So I would assume then, it pro is it listed in the spell as a component? Well, regardless, even if it's not, you can say you don't have the components well, you're yeah. in your pajamas. And you don't have a focus because what's your focus, your wand? You don't have a wand right now. And even if you yeah. did, you wouldn't be able to reach it because you're tied up. Yeah. I like that idea, by the way, using a focus as an option instead of a component, mm -hmm. right? If you don't have, uh, like, you could have a, an elemental wand that would be like your character's focus. And okay, so I do all my elemental spells with this. Right? So you lose the focus, you're kind of screwed for all those spells, and that's, hey, Song. that's fun. Hello, Isong! Nice to see you! I said if you'd show up, we'd show you our kitty. Oh, is that what the deal is? Okay. Yeah, she said so But she's time. sleeping! She's so cute! We don't want to wake her up when she's sleeping. No, 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 do not mess around with my camera. Every time you do, I have to spend half an hour fixing it. Do not touch my camera. I'll bite you. Alright, I'll pick up the cat then. <laughs> Here's our sleepy bones, kitty. Hello, this is Smokey. Hello, sleepy. Ducky pussy. She's pulling pretty good. I don't know if you can pick it up. Hmm. I should put her close to the camera so you can hear me. Yeah, I'll move my baby. No, no, I should stop for it. <laughs> okay, honey, I'll put it down. There's a kitty. Okay, I'm sorry. I know you were sleeping so good. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yes. You're a good girl. Uh, thanks for continuing the gift sub there, Second Hand Samurai. Oh, right on. Thank you so much. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, that might be something for her to do. Give her an NPC to control. Yeah. You think you heard cat go purr? Okay, that's cool. Apparently we're cute too. Oh, right that's back fun. to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Snoo. No, now she's looking at us like, what the hell? Why are you not petting me? <laughs> <laughs> it's always time for pats for her. Okay, now yes, I'm sorry for the sleep. Go back to sleep. Yeah, is that common in your game when you have a, a player who's out for whatever reason to give them an NPC to play? It looks like the game's all here, right on. Okay. Right. I would ask her how she feels about that. Right. Mostly in our game. You get to sit there if your character and can't do anything. Yeah, we're not very nice that way. Yeah. Well, what you can do is make suggestions to the other characters. Why don't you do this? We, we do allow that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a collective effort, right? Right. And our in-game logic for it, if you uh, ever wondered about, you know, well, how would you come up with an excuse for people to talk to each other if they can't actually talk to each other? Right, we basically say, okay, you get so used to working together, you start to think a little bit like the other person, right? 
So that's how we justify that. Second hand samurai says uh, DPC urchin is always fun and can become a fun but not overpowered retainer. Yes, especially if you give them a personality. <laughs> that can be a lot of fun. I agree with you. I think ask her how she feels about it yeah, and see uh, if she'd be interested in doing that for a game. Oh, you're not that late, Siobhan. Yeah, we just really got started. Hello, nice to see you. Storm Girl says, that's a great point. I like the way you think about things getting so used to working together. I might have to adopt that. We find it, uh, we find it makes it, the game more fun. Yeah, it makes the game flow smoother, too. Right? You don't have people sitting there going, well, one person does things for half an hour. Yeah, exactly. Other people right. are, like, yelling at them, well, talk to the guy! <laughs> Just ninja kick the damn rabbit. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> ninja kick the damn rabbit. <laughs> Kudos if you get the reference. Yeah. Yeah, extra okay. nerd points. Yeah, you get extra nerd cred if you get the reference. That's right. Um, by the way, I think that we should put a 500 point um, review. 500 point review? Okay. Yeah. Because 2,000 points for an editor or critique is too much for a World Anvil article. If it's a thorough edit, it's not. Yeah, edits, but uh, a, edits take a, a long showcase. time. Oh, a showcase. Well, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. yeah, showcase and some quick uh, quick critique. Yeah, yeah, sure, 500 seems reasonable. Okay. Yeah, because 2,000 is too much and, and you know, they're not long yeah. articles. Yeah, no, but it, I mean, it depends on the edit, right? Because right. I've now done uh, two situations where the edit took the whole stream, right? That's worth 2,000 points, I'm sorry it is, right? But if it's, uh, you know, but yeah, if it's like a short, you know, let's show it off and go over it and, oh, you missed an eye here or whatever, then yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Bob, I understand that too. I've had players like that in my games too. Uh, people that are like, you're not here, so shut up. Right, but you're right. You know, I I only crack down on it too when the person who is not there is directing the action. Right, right. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. At least one of my groups is pretty picky about the "you're not here to shut up" or "you're not here to shut up" thing, but that's their choice. I only object to the missing person action. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> DM Stretch says to rain, you know, maybe a little line boom will stop her Misty stepping away from it, or an anklet that prevents casting spells or hurts the wearer when they try to cast. You know what I do? I invented a thing. They're called mage cuffs, right? They cuff the two fingers of both of your hands together, right? Because most uh, somatic components involve a lot of specific ritual gestures in fantasy gaming, right? So if your hands are bound like this, mm -mm, that ain't gonna happen. Hm. Vampire, says Siobhan, reminding us why we are here, I suppose. Okay. I just figured we'd well, give people a chance. So. Yeah, DM Stretch was interested in in uh, basically getting a game of that going at some point in time. Right. He's never had a chance. Right. right. And I thought you guys would be able to talk about it a bit. Makes sense. Okay. okay, so the World of Darkness games, Vampire the Masquerade, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Mage the Ascension, all that stuff, that's my bread and butter. I really enjoy game mastering that particular system. I've not played any of the newer versions, Requiem or whatever, but the way I understand it, it's more or less the same thing except in terms of the system anyway. They changed things like the cultural aspects and uh, did a little game balancing stuff that maybe wasn't a bad idea. There were things in the first run of the, and, and even the second run of the storyteller system that was a little out of, uh, out of whack potentially. Right. I mean, um, yeah, go ahead. it being a role-playing based game, though, as opposed to a roll-dice playing game, 
uh, I find that um, I, I think it's okay depending on your storyteller or your game master, right? Like, because game balance can be maintained socially, but it can get out of hand with a, a less experienced uh, game master that way, right? So, yeah. Misty Step yeah. is a vocal spell, so it would be a case of your gag. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. All right, she can't Misty Step. She can't. She doesn't have the components for a fireball. Way to stop a vocal component hey, spell. The yes, we were talking about vampire. Yes. Yeah, DM Stretch says, hmm, a way to stop a vocal component spell, the Hannibal Lecter face mask. Yeah, that'd work. Yeah, or silence, as Zog says. Yeah. Yep. Zone of silence. Yep. It's a good idea. Yes. Yes, we were just starting to talk about the storyteller system, right? So the reason why I came on is because it's my favorite system. He's not as fun. Yeah. Like I say, it's, it's okay. I just find it very clunky. Um, this is a, a good chance to illustrate um, personal preferences of systems and how they can appeal to different game master styles, right? Mm -hmm. Aaron is a very technical gamer. He's very good at doing the number crunching. He's a math genius, right? So he just kind of does figures in his head. Thacko was never a barrier to him. He never had any issue with it. He just kind of... So he likes, you know, chewy systems, right? I don't. Right, because um, I have dyscalculia. Right, I'm I'm pretty bright. Like I'm a I'm a bright girl. Right, but uh, um, I have to stop and think about it, you know, and double check it to make sure I didn't misplace anything in the sequence. Right, I don't enjoy that. Right, I prefer something that's a bit more intuitive and more about you know hands-on flavor. Right, and the the cool thing about uh, um, the World of Darkness system and related games is that difficulty is all based on a number of ten-sided dice. Right, and you just kind of arbitrarily assign it. Really, right? It's a matter of okay, is this a you know really easy task? Right? Is this a moderately difficult task that has some risk? If like don't. I don't believe you should roll any dice unless there's consequences for failure, right? So if the consequence for failure is important, then make them roll, and that's about medium level difficulty. Or is it something that is damn near impossible, right? And you set the difficulty rating on a 1 to 10 scale, which most people are pretty good at kind of going, eh, I think that's about a 7, you know? And um, then you may also require multiple successes, right? So that means when you roll a 10-sided dice, if you've never played Vampire or anything like that before, you have a pool of dice, and that's kind of how your character stat works, right? Like, say, you have a manipulation score, for example, which is opposed to your charisma score. It's a different score, which I kind of like, right? And... Uh, um, generally you have a 1 to 5 rating in it, 1 is you suck, 5 is you're amazing, right? And you pool that usually with um, an ability, which will be a skill or a talent or a knowledge. And then you, you know, say you, you have, uh, you're trying to get a politician to do something for you, right? So the relevant uh, stat would be manipulation, because you're trying to make them do what you want. Or uh, you could use charisma, depending if you're trying to just get them to do something because they like you. There's some play to call on that. But the relevant uh, ability, right, is politics, obviously. Right? So say you have a manipulation of three and a politics of two, then that means you have a pool of five dice. So you pick up five ten-sided dice and you roll them. And you decide the difficulty of the task based on how hard it is and how many successes are required for complete success, right? Which means you can also do things like, rather than have something be a, uh, you know, fail or succeed one in a, you know, one die roll, you can also have extended tests, right? Say you, you know, are trying to get them to set up a homeless shelter, like legislate something so you can set up a homeless shelter, right? So um, maybe this is something that's going to take some time to work on. So you might have to accumulate a pool of successes and you can you know, continue to test and your failures subtract and your successes, you know, in uh, con conglomerate? Is that the word I'm looking for, I think? So, yeah. But, yeah, so there's a lot of freedom for, uh, you know, okay, maybe 
maybe in this case, say that was what you were doing, maybe the person doesn't have a politics score. Well, maybe law would also be relevant. Obviously, if you try to get legislation done, it would be. So then maybe your law um, test would be a little bit more difficult, right? It might be a six difficulty with politics, but an eight difficulty with law, right? And then that way people have multiple avenues of approach and it gives some room for very personal character creation. You can have people who are kind of jacks of all trades and do everything a little bit, or you can have somebody who's really specialized in a particular thing and it's totally up to them. Okay, so lots of chat while I was yapping. Let's see what I missed. Um, yeah, Secondhand says it's famous for becoming a monster vampire superheroes rather than a horror game if you play the system without leaning into the slower horror game. Yes. Yes, you really kind of have to put that in there, be but because yeah. otherwise it, it does lose that flavor. But hey, maybe that's what the, the game is that you want to play, right? Like uh, maybe you want to play a grim, bright setting, you know? The idea is the world is shit, but the characters have the power to change it. And that gives you some empowerment, right? And I think that's fine if you want to play that particular game. It's not what it was designed for, right? But no reason why you can't do that. I once played a uh, a rather old Ventru that hunted other vampires because he was a religious guy, right? He was a crusader who had been embraced against his will. And uh, he assembled a team of other vampires who got on board with that. So that was fun. song says explains why er likes pathfinder i found it too clunky at least with my xgm i find pathfinder a little clunky myself and the uh, but the reason why i like the system is because it has the feel of familiarity with me and besides he just does all the hard math so <laughs> it's so simple really um Right, count four, drink it five. <laughs> yes, apparently, like uh, Janet and Dimitri have their A words. I say right. What does he say, by the way? Because uh, we we could we could take on this competition. I'd be all for this. This would be fun. <laughs> Vampire the Masquerade sounds like something I'd love to play at some point, says DM Stretch. Seems like the only way to get a game is to run one, but having no experience with the game, I'm a little hesitant. Um, okay, my advice to you, if you're starting as a, a game master with it, right, storyteller is what they call it, right, and you, right, 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 okay, um, <laughs> and you haven't done it before, is read all the material. Um, and you know treat it like you're reading a history book because the setting is almost more important than the yeah. system yeah the setting is more important than the system than that which is why i like the storytelling system as opposed to the storyteller system yeah actually that that's a good opportunity to compare and contrast cyan yeah the cyan game i haven't tried cyan second edition yet right but the cyan game Right, uses a system similar to that, but allows for more leeway for higher powered characters. I do think it's that they thought they learned from their mistakes in the storyteller system and applied that to high powered characters in the storytelling system. You can play literal gods in that system mm -hmm. and it's balanced. It continues to be challenging right up to the point where you can throw aircraft carriers at each other. Yeah. Secondhand says, and I agree, horror games are really hard to run as a pickup game. You yeah. need to be careful of player boundaries and ready to make mistakes. Oh, right. yes, actually, thank you. That's a good point to bring up. I'll, I'll address that. Right. Um, allowing in fear takes trust, and that's hard without having flight time with that person. Yeah, you need yeah. to have at least one, and I'd say two, session zeros. 
the first one is to discuss, lay out the ground rules, okay? What are we okay with? Um, because horror is a pretty broad thing. If it's not terrible, it's probably not horrific. And some people just aren't comfortable with some subjects. And then you, you need to uh, nuance I really that. Think, I really think that if you're going to get involved in a horror game, that you should be upfront about it at the start. That this is an 18 plus non-safe space. Or whatever it is, you know, right? Because, right, well, if it's a horror game, it should be an 18 plus non-safe space. Not necessarily. Right. For example, right, say sexual violence comes up and somebody's mm. got a real trigger with that. You say, oh, okay, you, they could be okay. This is what I mean by nuance, right? right? To have it happen off screen, right? You can say, okay, your character was sexually assaulted. We don't need the gory details. Yeah, but right? I think that uh, if you're triggered by that sort of stuff, you probably shouldn't be playing horror games. Well, you should leave that part out of the game anyway. I don't think sexual violence comes up a lot with vampire. No. Because... Well, it's pseudo-sexual to begin with, but... Yeah, well, it's a metaphor for that kind of thing. Vampires are always have been, but... Vampires are a metaphor yeah, for Yeah, and syphilis. then modern writers began writing it as fear of the AIDS epidemic, which is part of the reason why Anne Rice's vampires were so popular mm -hmm. back in the day. But, um, yeah, like, I, I think you need to lay out the ground rules, and I think it's okay to have different ground rules, right? Vampire tends to be more horrific in many ways than werewolf if you're just taking the system. Wraith, which is about playing ghosts, tends to be more horrific than playing vampire. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. And Changeling tends to be not very horrific. No, Changeling's just goofy fun. <laughs> it is just goofy fun. Uh, Mage can be really interesting because that's a game, in my opinion, about philosophy. Right? So, comparing that. So, there's different options depending on what you want to play. And also, we've mixed games successfully. Right? We have played... They tell you not to do it in all the books, but we have successfully played groups that have included werewolves, vampires, and mages, and even a hunter, right? And that was related to the, the character I was talking about before, who was out to destroy vampires because they were a scourge in the earth, so. Yeah. Which version of Vampire the Masquerade World of Darkness do we recommend? Um, okay, I, I... We haven't tried the new one. Yeah, I have not tried Vampire Requiem, right? So yeah. I can't speak to it personally. New World of Darkness, we haven't tried. Right. Um, honestly, for me, that was a political choice. They, yeah, it they very much whole... felt like they were doing Vampire 2, the quest for more money. Right? That's what it felt like to me at the time. At the I'd... time. And... Remember that at the time, the books were $40 plus a piece and a market when every other gaming book was 25 right? And I had, like, all of them. I had collected... Oh, yeah, we got we got a lot of Vampire and Wraith. And I even Wraith had all the and... supplement material. I had the, you know, uh, Litany of the Dark and... Mother and, you know, the Book of Nod, and I had everything, right? So, um, and then they said, we're ending the world of darkness. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay, cool. We got some apocalyptic stuff. I'm going to check it out. And then all of a sudden they're like, and now we're bringing in this new world of darkness, which is exactly like the old world of darkness, except completely designed to be incompatible. So you can't use any of your books. Ha ah, ah, ha, you got to start over. And I went, no. So, but I understand the system is really good. People who have played it say that it's, uh, that it, they really enjoy it. It's a bit more simplified bit more in like terms of its politics. System. Yeah. Yeah, the, the game, the system works a bit more like Scion than it does the previous storyteller incarnation. Yeah. So it's, if you're worried about, uh, putting a rein on high-powered characters, you should probably go with that one, right? Because it does that. Um... I definitely do not recommend the first edition no, because it, was, it is it was bad. Because game balance is not a thing, right? Like it, they they had not. Uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes in the first edition of anything, and they made all their mistakes, right? They learned, oh geez, you know, I thought this was actually a pretty limited ability, but wow, is that out of hand? Maybe we won't include that in the second edition, right? So, um, 
but I think it's probably easier to mix the different campaigns if you're using the second edition, so it depends on what kind of game you want to play. Six, seven. Fifth edition from Mo <laughs> Mogius, yeah, okay. Alright, uh... Third edition was the edition before Vampire the Rock Room was released. Okay, so it's the third edition I'm talking about, the yeah. general that I'm most familiar with. <clears throat> Secondhand agrees the dice system is hands down better than the new system. Chronicles of Darkness is pretty tight. Yeah, if, if you're wanting like a good, you know, system that keeps things in order. Yeah, Siobhan's right. Some players also do look for ways to abuse abilities, right? And it was vague enough that it made it pretty easy for me. I could break that system in like 10 minutes. So it depends again on the group you're playing with. You have to have a group that is willing yeah. to... If you're willing to play by the rules, it's a good system, right? Or at least... So if, when, if... when I did play by the rules, we had a lot of fun by it. But also, it's it's uh, it's good for the kind of group where you can sit down and go, Okay, you know what? I realize this is what the rule book says, but it is not working. Can yeah. we try a different approach to this? If you have that kind of group, then... Uh, what third edition? Oh, D.W. Rowland, happy to hear from you before. And welcome to our stream. All right, uh, Vampire Mask Great Fifth Edition is pretty easy to learn. I'm writing my first chronicle now. Are you Great. writing it on World Apple? Well, thank you for the follow. And thank you for the follow, yes. Aaron's at four rates himself. Excellent. I agree, World Anvil is fabulous. Sure, that's awesome, man. Yeah. I say man as a gender neutral term. Yeah. <laughs> I say man because I'm male. Also, dude and guys are gender neutral dude terms guys. where we come from. Gender neutral from me, too. Yeah. One of us, one of us, exactly. Yeah, it, it's. I think it's addictive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um. Yeah. yeah. I, I, okay, I'm preaching the choir. I'm not going to sing the praises. Yeah, we're not going to sing the praises of World Anvil on here because, as far as I've seen so far, every single person that's spoken up in the chat is from World Anvil. So, which is, yeah. makes sense since in. Right there. Where is it here? That corner? Down? Right there? Yeah. There's the Anvilite Streamer Core badge. That's right. Which our Moobot will give you the address for, but it's actually pretty simple. Uh, if you want to uh, yeah, watch more World Anvil the... streams, it is uh, worldanvil.com slash ASC. There's a link. <laughs> yes, eSong is also a member, if you're not familiar. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I wish I'd had World Anvil. When I was doing our yeah. campaign. Yeah, I just started my new Battletech campaign. And uh, with the exception of the fact that there are no character sheets for it on there, it is just fabulous for keeping track of information. But you can request that. Stuff. Yeah, I know I can. Yeah, because I'm Sage, so I can request things like that, right? You can just ask anyway, but uh, yeah, as but a Sage, you are, I, I think you have the ability to request yeah, that specific. something like that. I don't know. World Anvil is the tool we all dreamed about 30 years ago. Yes. So right you are. So right you are. <laughs> World Anvil is the tool I dreamed about when I first uh, started playing, right, in 1977. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I were doing the... Okay, I, I don't tend to use the plot uh, function very much in the role play tools yeah. with the games that we currently have going. But... I would use it extensively for a vampire campaign because it does tend to be pretty political and things tend to take decades even to unfold. So I would be keeping track of all of that in vivid detail and linking that to the different characters and there would be spoilers that would be GM only notes that uh, we would be looking at a lot more than I've currently got going on. So. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, that's what I would be doing with it as far as that goes. But you'd like, okay, Aesong says, uh, I, I'd like to have you 
I'd like to have you do is how you use World Anvil for your campaign. What, sh what she'd like you to do right. is show how you use World okay. Anvil for your campaign. Okay, well, this is the one that I'm starting with. I'll just go and fire it up here. Yeah, you're going to have to log out of my World Anvil yeah. and log into your own. I'm not sure why I have filament up right now, other than it's an awesome world. Oh, right, I was listening to her. Oh, you, you want, like, my thing, don't you? Yeah. I was listening to her theme song, so her cat uh, commissioned a theme song. It was awesome. Yeah. In the meantime, while he's doing that, does anybody have any questions related to Vampire the Masquerade in particular? I'm looking down here if you're wondering because this is where my screen manager is set up and I can't see the screen right now or the chat because he's searching, which is fine. Okay, I've, uh, okay, where are we here? Yes, uh, I've been using the plots part recently for my new 5e, uh, Ravnica? Ravnica? Tell Ravnica. Me how Ravnica? Cool, Ravnica campaign. That's yeah, Ravnica, that's, uh, um, that, uh, little bit magic gathering oh okay yeah uh yeah world anvil's virtual tabletop is pretty good as well yes and uh yeah that's um foundry vtt isn't it yeah they were just integrating with that i'm yeah. thinking about trying it out we currently yeah. use uh fantasy ground, fantasy but, ground I but i really like their visual display especially for streaming i was like oh that looks really sharp and that would probably be a lot easier to <laughs> we play an online game so yeah no worries you saw no you're fine i hate autocorrect on my phone um <laughs> pcs uh player wanted the npc to control cool that's that's good so it sounds like you've got a solution there yeah yeah oh that's pretty cool yeah that makes sense yeah magic the gathering and D are both owned by wizards of the coast so they brought the setting across yeah, that, that does make sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, D.W. Rowland says uh, Fantasy Grounds is a solid product. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's got some things I, I, I uh, personally dislike. One is that it's a memory hog. It's huge. It takes forever to load. Uh, so difficult for your players who are poor and have crappy laptops. Um... Other than that, I like it though. Yeah. Okay, um, D.W. Rollins, before I get in the show of this thing, I'll just answer this question. Right. All right, question about vampire. I'm writing my first chronicle and trying to figure out when I'm prepared enough. Any tips for figuring this out? Um, the only tip I can give you to figure that out is when you figure you've covered all the angles. Because the thing about vampire is that Players are going to do things that you never expected because it's a political game. All play, all games. This is true. Yeah, but especially in a political <clears throat> one. Yeah, I right? agree with that. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I messed Dan right up in one campaign by attacking the main bad guy, who was supposed to be our our boss, right? Because we're vampires in the Sabbath, right? That's and okay, I made a bigger bad. Yeah. So that's she had to wing it from there. Yes. Um, okay, so vampire in particular is a top-down structure. So whenever somebody is manipulating stuff, they've got somebody behind the scenes manipulating them. Who has somebody behind the scenes manipulating them, right up to the antediluvians who yeah. basically are gods. Even to Methuselahs, and I've played Methuselah vampires working against the machinations of the antediluvians, so, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I've approached it as both a player and a game master, right? So, um, yeah, basically have an idea of how your top-down structure works. When you're starting with whatever the situation is, say you're doing masquerade specifically, and it's the local prince, the prince has a boss. The prince may not realize they have a boss, but they have a boss. 
Who is that boss? What are they trying to accomplish? It may be something completely different than what the prince is trying to accomplish. Right. Who so is basically, the prince's boss? Yeah, basically <clears throat> you got to stay, stay one step ahead of the characters. The characters are going to be worried about the whip or the um, sergeant at arms to start with, right? So you worry about what they're doing, right? And when they've reached that point where those people are no longer a threat to them, politically or physically, right? Then you've got to worry about the harpies and the, you know, yeah, the next level up, right? And the primogen and, and the primogen and stuff like that, right? Um, when they get to the point where they're sitting on the primogen council or stuff like that, then you've got to worry about the prince, right? So you you figure out what the prince wants, uh -huh. right? And the other thing is, too, if you're doing Vampire right, you should never be entirely certain of any character's motivations. Yeah. So, even someone who seems nice and kind and sweet, you should uh, definitely cast doubt. Maybe oh, yeah. they've got a really great relationship with their sire, but their sire is going to secret meetings and not telling them anything about where they're going or why. Why are they doing that? You know, you should you should make the, the characters always yeah. wonder, and any effort of trust should be a risk. Oh yeah. I played the nicest salubri vampire you ever met, but... Yes, but... But. <laughs> yeah, Unity's still in beta, so they're working on a bunch of stuff, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Question, for any tabletop RPG, but thinking of 5e in particular, as that's what I'm writing right now, how much of a campaign do you write before you're ready to run the first session? Uh, I write none. <laughs> <laughs> He's been doing this long enough now that he wings it totally off. Oh yeah, I totally off the top of my head, right? You know, I go, like, session zero, it's like, okay, uh, here's our concept, let's go with it, and I'll come up with some way to put the characters together, and we'll just go from there. Um, I need a bigger plan. Yeah, talk to her. Right, so... <laughs> um, okay, so I start with, what are my campaign goals? Like, what what is this about? It, it goes back to that agile world-building material that uh, the Cal conference dealt with, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, and the presentation recently at Gen Con Online, right? Um, Janet and Dimitri have a really good way of handling it, and that's basically what you need. You need to start with kind of a meta... What is my campaign about? What is this world about? What are the themes? What is the feeling that I'm trying to accomplish here? And everything should come back to that root. If you're if you're going off of that, then you know you need to either redefine the meta, which does happen, especially in an ongoing campaign that you've been playing for years and years and years, or you know you need to kind of work things back to that root. So. Um, I guess I start with a main concept. Maybe I, would it help to take you through my process in terms of one of the longer running vampire campaigns I did? Probably. You think? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you're welcome, DW. I hope it was helpful. Cool. Um, I remember playing a Bloodbound Ghoul, which messed with Sable's game. Yes, Siobhan did, because uh, Siobhan, of course, had the advantage of she can act during the day. Life goals. Yes. Okay, so here's my process. Okay, so I decided to try a historical campaign. Um, I set it in the 1750s during the Age of Enlightenment. It's a, we don't talk about the 1750s much, but it's a time when there were lots of new ideas that were changing the way we view religion and science, and this basically led to the modern era. It was kind of a, a mini renaissance. Yeah, it's where mage. Um... Sorcerer's Crusade comes from. Right, right, exactly. So that was uh, a very good reason in the world of darkness to set it there. Because mages could be allies or antagonists, depending upon the situation. But it was a vampire campaign. So why, I, I, why did I set it at that time? Because I wanted to explore those ideas. I wanted to compare science and, and religion and magic and where does it meet up and also there were uh, the first stirrings of a lot of revolutionary ideas that came about during that time and I wanted the characters to have the opportunity to explore that. Um, 
Uh, okay, so my rule, just incidentally with historical campaigns, is I'll set the date and the uh, history that you know from history books to the best of our ability to discern and a lot of behind the scenes stuff but the, the, the facts that we have in the history books happened the way they happened to that point whether they were caused by the things we were caused we think they're caused by is uh, up for debate but that's the situation but after that the characters have agency and they can change things so if uh, they decide that they're going to start the American Revolution 50 years early, they can do that, which they did. So, <laughs> um, and ended slavery in the Americans about 50 years early. Yes, because that's what they decided they wanted to do. Right? They were vampires who were very good at holding on to their humanity virtues. Um, well, those of us who had. Yeah, some of them just had a very specific code of honor, but they were more like, we need to preserve our resources here. Yeah. If humans all kill themselves, then what benefit are they going to be to us? You know, so... I understand these yeah, characters were savage vampires. Well, they didn't start that they way. They didn't start that way. They started off as part of the Camarilla, but uh, the Camarilla... Yeah, but ultimately it came back to exploring the ideas. That's what I was there right. for. And, and this happened in art, so it gave the Toreador something to do. And it happened in uh, politics, so that gave the Bruja something to do, and the Ventru. True. You know, um, there were revolutions, so that gave the more martial characters something to do. Uh, the Gangrel was... Uh, due to the Gangrel, the indigenous people of North America ended up in a lot better position. Yeah. Right? Because that's something they wanted to support. They supported it, and uh, frankly didn't have much opportunity to, to, to abuse the natives. Well, yeah. Well, more than they had already. I mean, right. you know, couldn't stop smallpox. But... Yeah. So, so, yeah, but ultimately it came back to those ideas. So if people wanted to explore those and take it to extremes, okay, right? I wasn't particularly interested in making history match up. So ultimately it came back to that. So I planned what the political movers and shakers behind the scenes were up to and why they were up to it. Um, a big antagonist turned out to be the Ventru power structure because, of course, they were supporting the uh, aristocracy and nobility. So, um, and our characters were mostly Bruja. Yeah, mostly Bruja and Game <laughs> Girl and a couple of Toreador, right? So <laughs> that gave them a natural antagonist there. And uh, there, of, of course, you know, they ran afoul of the Silver Fangs once or twice. Um, they as the the time expanded because these are vampires you can go for 200 years or 500 years or whatever if you're willing to i mean eventually at some point you got to go okay should we be looking at the elders rules should we be giving them more power so that's uh that was something that happened in this because it went on for i want to say seven years we did this campaign for oh shit uh We're still playing those characters when we moved here in 2000. Right, and okay, so maybe so, as much as 10 years. Yeah, probably we started... 10 years we played the characters for. Okay, somewhere between there, right? So yeah, it went on for a long time. Um, by the time they got to the Victorian age, right, it was, uh, yeah, I, I felt they needed a power boost. But, and then it became much more political and a lot less action. Yep. So... Because it came to the point where certain characters could just destroy other people. Okay, but then we started, okay, if, uh, I had my Ventru, and then I thought about, well, who, you know, who's controlling the Ventru? Why are they manipulating them in this way? And it's, uh, it, it's fun if you put in different multiple threads, right? Because, um, you know, the, the Silver Fangs and the Ventru were sort of in competition for the uh, control of the royalty of Russia, and they were also in competition for the control of the royalty in Britain. And in the world of darkness, basically, if you follow their books, the Silver Fangs won out in Russia, at least until the Communist Revolution, and then the Ventru won out in the UK. So, you know, but then there's the mages. And remember, the mages are just kind of coming into the uh, mage, the ascension idea. So they ended up clashing with mages a lot more because of that. And technocracy. 
yeah, the technocracy in particular. Yeah. So it's uh, I, I I think think about each political figure and then think of at least three people who are trying to manipulate them and why and what they're trying to accomplish. And then you don't have to have that all planned out before you start. Start with the big uh, the big bad wherever they are, right? Whether that's yeah. the whip or whatever. Or the yeah, sergeant at arms, or, or even the prince. Or even the prince. Right, if you've been setting up a long-term right. antagonist, ne nemesis type thing, right? You know, if the prince is going to be their nemesis, understand who he is and who's manipulating him. And then probably your characters will seize on one of your three ideas. So, um, and, and you can choose to handle that in one of two ways. Either they've uh, picked the wrong one and it's a red herring, or they've picked the right one and now you, you can branch that out. So they go to their boss. Well, who is controlling them? Think of at least three different factions that are, and so on. Yeah, so that's my process. And I, I would write it yeah. down as like a, I would take the previous uh, session and write it as if the Toreador were writing a story about it, because I was I had a Toreador NPC that was hanging out with them, and they would write it as if they were writing a a, uh, a story about it in the style of novel at the time, which was rather long-winded, right? So that's yeah. Yeah, so DM Strix says he's thinking that this campaign story will run for 10 to 12 sessions. That's probably a good time for a story. You 10 bet. to 12 sessions, yeah. Right, and uh, right, about session six, you should start thinking about the next story. And if they're not winding towards the climax at section six, you need to step up the action in some way. Yeah. If that's your time frame. Yeah. Yeah, I think that probably, I was just checking the chat to see if yeah. there was anything I had missed, but I think that's reasonable to address. It's probably our other character to get rid Smothers all dissenting note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that was helpful. Um, I also do think of it in terms of stories, right? I start with, okay, uh, what are the characters trying to accomplish at this point, right? And me, or what do I want them to try to accomplish? The goal, uh, at one point, the goal was to get one of the people that they were uh, um, associating with to become the diva of the Paris Opera. That was the goal. So telling the story about that and, and the manipulations of power was the process and that took about I think 20 sessions but we like long marathon games usually and uh, then there was another one where uh, the goal was to foment the rebellion in Paris we did a lot of stuff around Paris that was kind of where I set the campaign at first and then they moved to the new world and started doing things from Montreal um, the Let's see, what, what was another story? There was another story about uh, one where romance was the theme and how the pressures of vampire politics drive lovers apart. And so I planned that to take... That was uh, Kevin's character there, Evangelina. Right, not not as... That was the, the one he his character was in love with, right? Evangelina, so... So she betrayed him, of course. Because, yeah. Because she's a vampire. That's right. And they're evil. How do old and confidence Okay. That's cool. That's very uh, topical. Yeah. Yep, my overall theme is how do old and powerful institutions react when they realize that their days are numbered. Well, I think we're watching it, if you want my personal opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's great. So what do they do, right? They circle the wagons. They try to uh, protect their own uh, interests. They stomp out dissent 
they get increasingly more authoritarian and oppressive as they try to stop out that dissent. Um, usually somebody who is a bad actor recognizes that there is a vulnerability in the collapsing structure and tries to or perhaps succeeds at taking control of it in order to run it themselves. Um, yeah, right? So there's lots of stuff you can play with there, for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm using uh, Theo Bell's Murder of Hardstat as the beginning of the end for the Ventru as leaders in the Camarilla. That's an excellent choice of political event. That's, that's amazing. That's very cool. Okay, so I can see a lot of things happening out of that. As a matter of fact, that piece of history behind the scenes would explain per, uh, per current world politics very well, I think. I think you've got something there that's a lot of fun. I mean, Brexit. Yep. <laughs> you know? Brexit is clearly a Ventrue circling the wagons reaction that is way anachronistic and out of touch, you know? Yeah. Not familiar with the event. Yeah, it's uh, it's an in-game thing that I think appeared right before they started shutting down the second edition World of Darkness, right? So, um, Hardstat was a powerful Ventru who was embraced sometime in the Middle Ages, who was actually a, a you know, he was a conservative, but he was mostly fair. You know, a little brutal, and uh, he was kind of keeping things under heel for a while, but then, uh, uh, I think Theo Bell was a, was a bruja, right? And he murdered him because they had, well, I mean, it's vampire, so it's complicated. There were political differences, there were personal issues that went on for hundreds of years, you know. So, um... And then that left a big power vacuum, right? So when there is a power vacuum of something that's been established for a while, things often go to shit, right? We see this in history all the time. I don't like viol uh, violent revolutions because violent revolutions always result in uh, eventually another worse dictator getting established. That's almost always the case because everything goes to hell, there's no leadership, and somebody just strong arms everybody into obeying what they want to get done, right? So. Yeah, the White Wolf Wiki has Hardest at the Younger with all the important more details about it in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there is a White Wolf Wiki, so useful to look that up. Dan Stretch says, I imagine they react like a cornered animal. That's been my experience. Yeah. Old and trans power structures being uprooted, they lash out at everything around them. So does anybody have anything else they want to ask specifically about uh, vampire, mage, werewolf? <laughs> um... We've played some really great werewolf campaigns too, right? Um, in the meantime, while I'm asking that question, I'll suggest this. When you get everybody to sit down and discuss it about what they want to do, one of the things you should ask is, do you want crossovers to be an option? Because they're not designed to be, but the thing is, if you're looking to play more of a grim bright than a grim dark campaign, and you want to give the characters agency, it's very clear from the established material that the secret to having that agency is to work together. It's very difficult, especially in a vampire game particularly, to get people to trust each other, and like I said, it should always be a risk, there should always be a doubt when you're playing vampires. Werewolves tend to get violent with each other, and that is what destroys their efforts to work together. So, um, you know, this takes committed characters who are committed to mastering their rage, characters who may take penalties in combat because they're trying to be more peaceful, right? So, Philodox types tend to do well in, in that scenario. 
right? So, uh, but be aware that if they if they want crossovers to be an option, right? Or if you want crossover, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't want crossovers to be an option. But if you if you allow crossovers, you're immediately allowing a brighter game, right? So, and the characters have more agency, and you should be aware of that and plan for it. And then I say there's nothing wrong with playing that game, right? Sometimes. When you're feeling depressed about the world, it can feel very good to go to a very dark setting and make it bright. So that's fine. <coughs> if you play it like it's written with the horror game, then you need to limit character agency. And people need to be willing to accept those limits if they want to play that kind of game. So power gamers are anathema to accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish in a traditional vampire game. Yeah, Hope Punk there you saw. Yeah. Yes, absolutely Hope Punk. She's been listening to the podcast. So, yes, Hope Punk, right? If you want to play Hope Punk, nothing wrong with that. I love it, right? I think it's a lot of fun. But I've also played some very dark, creepy, <sighs> sorry about that. You know, horror campaigns. Uh, one thing we did in our uh, werewolf campaign was explore the horrors of war, right? Uh, Post-traumatic stress was a big theme in that game, right? And trying to overcome tragedy was something that was huge, right? We had like huge massacres that occurred as a result of the character's own uh, oversights and oversights, yeah. right? So. So that was uh, a lot of fun, dealing with survivor's guilt and, and whatnot. And that was the horror we wanted to explore in that campaign, right? The horror of losing your moral compass is the central theme of Vampire. And I actually think, despite the fact that the characters in the longest running campaign we had eventually decided they wanted to destroy the other vampires, let's think about the loss of moral compass that's required to go and murder everybody who's just like you. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they definitely was part of it. Well, right? it didn't help if they were brainwashed by my character. Mm. <laughs> so, he a hunter. <laughs> so he did. So he did. Yeah, Changeling looks like a good choice for Grim Bright, though the overall tone is sad. Yeah, it can yeah. be. It can be. If, if you want to play that kind of game, I say that Changeling is excellent. Um, Changeling, as it's written, I couldn't play. Yeah. Right? I couldn't play it, not because it isn't awesome, because it really is. It's awesome. The setting is amazing, but because it just made me too sad. Right? For me, that was a personal, uh, a line that was crossed that I wasn't prepared to cross. Changeling is about the loss of dreams, the loss of imagination, and the loss of childhood innocence. And I feel that this is something that uh, I have been fighting my entire life, right? So I found it really depressing to explore that, and I just didn't enjoy it, right? But other people do, and that's, you know, that's totally cool. Uh, what are we screaming no about, Siobhan? Is that the loss of innocence, imagination, and, uh, and, and dreams? Yeah, for me that was a step too far. And Wraith can be, like, really visceral in its emotions, but it wasn't. Yeah. Yep, that's right. I'm with you, Siobhan. I feel that way too. I can't lose any more dreams, hope, or childhood innocence. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so I found it tough. Hey, Harold, yeah. nice to see you. Thanks for dropping in to say hi. And we're just finishing up talking about Vampire the Masquerade and other uh, World of Darkness games. Mm -hmm. You should probably ask him more about Cyan if you're interested in that setting, because he knows he's done more game mastering in it than I have. And he can give you his comparison on the two systems. Um, I like playing in his game in that one. I, I've, I mean, like I've run it too, but he's done it more. And I do all the systems for anyways, even when she's running it. Yeah, usually. Right. Yeah. Do um, like crunch the math really well. Yeah, it takes him like ten minutes to make a bad guy. It takes me two hours. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I let him. I let him crunch numbers. He's good at not metagaming, so it's fine. 
Um, but yeah, I think that's a lot of fun too because then you get to explore mythology and legends and uh, fairy tales and folk tales. And um, this is a keen interest of mine. So yeah. I want to get back into our Cyan game, says Siobhan. We should talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk. We should talk about that because I think I would too. That'd be fun. Miss Hamlet and Horse. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll hand him the reins for a while and, and uh, you know, because the problem was I just got too busy and ran out. It wasn't giving it the energy that, it required. Yeah, that's another thing. These systems require your attention. Yeah. It's not like D&D. &D, you can't really whip up a, a, you know, dungeon crawl in like an hour before the session and let people have at it. Right? right. You need to plan because it's about the plot and it's about the story. It's not about the systems. Yeah, so, it, it, because in Scion, if you get too much fighting, you all die. Yeah. Right? Sooner or later, you're going to run into something that just has dice pools that you cannot compete with. Right. Um, so, uh, basically, I, I just kind of ran out of steam is what happened when I was running that one. And that happens. Yeah. You know, and I think that... Uh, my... I might be able to take that one. We'll talk if you want. Yeah, C, Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, no doubt. I've only ever run one Call of Cthulhu game, and it went over really well. I played in a couple. Yeah, my least favorite system, GURPS. GURPS? Why? No game balance at all. No, GURPS has game balance. You're thinking Palladium. Am I thinking Palladium? Yeah. Okay, Palladium. No game balance at all. Yeah, you're right, I am. None. That's why I don't like it. Also, it makes no sense, right? In my opinion, you start at first level and you have a 15% chance of actually succeeding at the thing that you're supposed to be able to do for your class. This is stupid. Why would you try if yeah. you were that bad at it, right? Um, yeah. My personal opinion. Yeah. Both purposes, Harold. Well, maybe I've had crappy DMs. I do admit that uh, the most sexist uh, game masters I have ever played with have been the uh, ge my general experience of Palladium. So that might I, I yeah, fully make that myself. That's uh, oh generic universal role playing system. Oh okay okay. Right. It's a, basically a system that that came out in the late eighties, early nineties that uh, converted yeah, every yeah, other yeah, system to that. it. Yeah, I remember that now. Yeah. yeah. Which only worked if you had someone like him who can crunch numbers, by the mm -hmm. way. So like, gotta have a good number here. cruncher to get that one off. Yeah, house. I would not. I would not run GURPS because I would feel way intimidated by it. Yeah, there there are other things I can do. So yeah. Okay, it looks like they want to talk to you about your process of uh, creating stuff for campaigns. So okay, well I'm gonna take a brief break here. I gotta go get another drink and. Stuff. Yeah, and then I'll and I, I'm, I'm out, out as of this point. So, thanks very much, guys, and I hope that some of what I had to say was helpful. And you know, keep on gaming because it's fun. So it's, it's our favorite activity, right? So. Yeah. Well, thanks, DM. I, I hope it was. Yeah, I hope it was good advice. Sa okay. Savage Worlds is good for that generic thing too. Says Harold's table. Absolutely yeah. agree. That is true. Absolutely. I haven't tried Savage Worlds yet, but I've looked I've only it. played it briefly, but I loved it. Thanks, TW. Okay, he'll be back in a few minutes. I'll be back in a few minutes. I won't. So, thanks again.
Okay, I'm back. All right, uh, I think it was Isan. Well, double scratch back and see what we can do. Yeah, Isan asked to see how I um, use World Anvil in my campaign. Okay, so I'll show you a couple of things here. All right, um, I'm currently in my campaign, so we'll go over there. Okay, all right, um, in this I only have one world of my own, but then I've got two worlds that I work with with Sable. Right. The third succession war is the war that the world that I'm just currently working on. All right, uh, I just started this. All right, um, I have nothing in the codex yet, but in the compendium I have a few articles that I've been building. All right, to start with, I'll show you this is like one of the characters that I put in. Uh, Uh, his history and such. All right, I recorded that all here for people to be able to see. All right. Um. Yeah. All right. And then this is his daughter. All right. which I recorded here. And then we have the Canadian ethnicity, right? From the, that is recorded here, which is, you know, people from the colony of New Canada. All right. The only geographic location I've got going, oh, I have no geographic locations. All right, I thought I did. All right. Um, Military formations. I heard the first Canadian borderers. That's the unit that he belongs to. That's their flag. All right. And then uh, the thing, the game information about the first Canadian borderers and first Canadian auxiliary, their composition and structure. I have General Motors, but I haven't done anything with it yet. All right, General Motors is the maker of one of their battle mechs. All right, um, if you under want to understand Mech Warrior, all right, think of uh, think of uh, giant Rock'em Sock'em robots with lasers and machine guns on them that they fight each other with. All right? It's a interesting way to conduct war. Stable on that. We're confused by the politics, but we like our American friends. All right. Anyways, I haven't done anything with either of the organizations yet. All right. um, and I haven't done rank or title yet. All right, for the ranks that I'm going to do, but I will be. All right. Ah, species. All right. I have human, which I didn't do anything for because everyone knows what it is. It's just a base thing, and then heavy worlder. Right, which is a person who comes from a world with heavy, gravity heavier than Terra's. Right, and uh, right. 
I just have humans for their genetic ancestors. And the related ethnicities being Canadian because can New Canada is a heavy gravity world. Right? And so our characters are heavy worlders. And then finally I have heavy mech which is just a placeholder for the Marauder. Right? The Marauder, I painted this by the way. You can tell this even got my flags on it. Stuff. Right? And uh, yeah, then an overview and capabilities, battle history, variants, notable mech warriors, different information about it. Right? Stuff that characters are going to want to know. For example, our roommate, Steve, he pilots one of these too, so he's, if he wants to look it up, he can just come click on this and look it up. I started doing this one. This one? Hasn't got a picture yet, but yeah. But uh, basically, it's to record the information that I think my players are going to want to have on hand. I'll show you uh, the one campaign I've got. This is the campaign that I'm running. Right? The campaign stream doesn't have a lot on it. Right? Uh, this just shows the campaign stream of everybody. They doing. Right? With pictures of the characters on the side here. Protagonists. Give a list of all the PCs. Okay. And then NPCs. I don't have pictures for any of them. I established one party, right? Uh, the crew of the Aryan Rod's Pride. This just shows the, how you can keep track of who's in what party.
Right, so that helps me with that. Right, I used the plots a little bit in this, but I haven't updated them much because, wow, it's a lot. Right, but you can see uh, when you want to have new plots or whatever. Right. Uh, sessions. Right, each session that we do, I put up a session note here. All right, I gotta convert, change a couple of them, but I used to be more uh, interested in giving the characters a a small uh, uh, intro to the session, but some mostly I don't now, but. You've also got journal entries and uh, such from the various characters here, right? That you can look at. So like those are the sessions we've done. We do one a week. Alright. Yeah, and uh, the primer I haven't used much of, but there is a little bit in here. Alright. Um these are stuff that the world articles that you can read that will help you out with uh the campaign things that you might want to know right um, yeah we have no primer articles in here yet but we could add them by clicking on these but they, uh, I don't know what settings do all oh, right that's the uh, general settings But that's basically how I use it, right? Is to uh, record the stuff that I think the players are going to want to know and to keep an eye on uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, you want to see game stats for creatures like the Star Kraken. Okay, I can show you that. Okay, where am I going here? Reorganized everything, so. Monster NPC, and yeah. Okay, so we're looking at Now, I 
hate this keyboard. Give me one minute, folks. I'll be right back. Ah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was just saying that I went to go get my keyboard because Sable's keyboard sucks. It's a QWERTY keyboard and I only have one hand. So, right, I used a Dvorak for right-handed keyboard. Right-handed keyboard. So, as Sable was saying, to me while I was grabbing my keyboard. The thing about the Star Kraken is that there are three stages of its existence, right? It has a l pupil larval stage, right? An immature Star Kraken stage and a mature Star Kraken stage, right? And uh, each of those is very different. So I'm gonna have to come up with three monster templates for it. So I'm going to start off with the, uh, where am I here, okay, I'm starting off with the Star Kraken Larval. So 
size is huge. Type is monstrous. Magical Beast. Subtype is Stellar. Senses. Well, it has Light vision, and dark vision. This is a special me measurement done for our game. A hex is a unit of gravity. All right. All right. Um, and uh, yeah. So, short description is this is the larval. Okay, armor class. Now we're gonna figure that out. Okay, we figure. Uh, I need to look at a book, I think. and then my book's on here. Okay, I have to look up a book. So I have to wait for it to download now.
Okay, so we're gonna go to the giant squid, which is on 259 of the beast theory. Giant squid are neutral, huge animal, aquatic. Okay. Right, since we're using the giant squid. Because that's basically what they look like is a giant squid. Right. We can compare it to the, the squid's armor class, and it has a 9 natural, minus 2 for size, plus 3 for dex. Okay, that seems about reasonable. So we go. So in that, we would begin there, plus 10 makes it 20 base, and then we would look at it with, with flat footed, he loses his dex bonus, so it would be 17. And Touchy loses his natural armor, but keeps his dex bonus, so it would be 13. Now we'll give it the same hit dice as a, as a Kraken. Alright, which is 12. But it's a magical beast, not an animal. So now we're going to look up that then. Index. On the appendices. sure I'm looking in the right book because I never look at these bloody things. No, I'm not.
there. So he gets D10s, not D8s. Alright. So. So 12D10 plus 48. So hit dice are 12. Unlike them, um, okay. unlike squid, right. these things regenerate quickly. Now we got to figure out good saving throws. So let's back to the book. Let's see for the hit dice. Good fortitude reflex. Skills are two plus ten. Traits darkness and light vision Christian. That's what we have to see. I must see if they can breathe. Okay. So good fortitude and reflex saves. So twelve goes six eight. Eight and twelve would go there for four. So we when we figure out their abilities. Wherever I put those in what the hell? Ability scores. Where they give the Kraken, I was about to say. The giant squid. Just copied straight out of the book. Alright. Yeah, it looks reasonable for their stats. Okay, so fortitude 8, reflex 8, fortitude plus 4, reflex plus 3, plus 1. So fortitude plus 12. Reflex plus 11. Will plus 5. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna get a drink. Yeah, okay, so now we've got that. I was right, it's 114. It's not 112. Okay. Defensive ability in cloud, 20 foot radius.
30 foot radius. So next thing we need is its speed. It's on speed. Uh, let me copy this out of here. Space and reach. Space is 15 feet, reach is 15 feet with 30 feet with arms and tentacles. start by taking a copy of its attacks.
make some roll, roll, and roll that one. No range attack, special attacks. Check again. Constrict. Set bonus is twelve. CMB, how do you put that thing? That's strength, the size modifier plus strength goes twelve and twelve is twenty four. Minus two for. CMB as soon as you see him, he plus your X bonus, so that would be from nine. feet.
Two to fourteen reflex saves. And thirteen. Rocket. Thank you. 
is solitary. Okay, there we go. JS. <coughs> oh. I'm just going to put that under general description. I'm going to go back to their immune cold. Here. Copy. 
pray for me. Yeah, no. Hey. And that's the basics for the larval gun star cracking now. Right? The hard part is to look in the book and figure out what challenge rating this thing should be. So Forty-one damage is right about where it should be. Primary ability is to me. Good saves are slightly high. Or slightly slightly low. Okay, so it's challenge rating 9 according to this. And from what I can crunch, I think a 9 level party would kick the Christ out of this thing. Okay, there we go, there we have a horrible star cracking. I'll let her tag it and everything.
Okay. Oh, I got raided. Oh, thank you. Laura Bones raided. Thanks, Laura. Sorry, I was uh, making a monster for Esong here. Showing her how to do it. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Esong. I didn't uh, get around to answering your question. I oh, will answer it next time. Okay. Alright. Now quickly adjusting. It's right here, but we're going to have another bracket in. Oops. We're going to have another bracket in. Say That there is how I'm gonna create a monster for Sable's game, for Sable's world. Oh, wrong line. Oh, as fast as I've ever put one together, but mostly it was copying and pasting, but it had to deal with determining whether or not it was the same stuff or. Hmm. Well, Siobhan, I was looking at your message there. I come and I go, stupid phone, with no punctuation, and didn't see the phone part. So it makes it look like you said, I come and I go, stupid. What's the new campaign you're writing there? DM stretch. pretty much wraps up what I had to talk about today, but I guess I could kill some time while we Ah. Set in Ravinica, splinter cells of Golgari and Slimic working together to create a new guild to take over Ravinica under the one guild. Zuharit. I would he's causing mass panic with violence. This Ravinica is one with the gas. Okay. You need help with a new name for it. I 
or the character is going to be part of this plot or trying to stop it. Okay, um, how about something like In For Life? Okay, uh, let's see if I can think of something else then. Or something like the pro-life movement. <laughs> I think uh, the only one I can really think of at the moment right now is in it or in for life. In it for life. about till death do we part. Okay, I better change this back to Diane's stuff.
Okay. There's nothing else I can think of at the moment there to begin, right? I hope that those ideas, those will spark some ideas for you. nobody on here at four o'clock. Kahuna, ah, perfect. Yeah, I'm gonna raid Kahuna then, right? Um, I got uh, nothing much more to say, so I'm gonna end the stream about three minutes early and raid Kahuna. All right. Uh, thank you for watching. Thanks for being here. All right. Um, remember to support your local staff and see you on Friday. chat or raid call is prepare to be boarded. I'm glad that you've been getting some stuff done there. Lorraine. I hope I was helpful. Okay. We're off raiding Kahuna in nine, eight, seven. Hey, we are raiding. Thanks for being here, guys. <laughs>